Hi, this is Pastor Tim. Welcome to this week's study guide. We're in a series called The Church. We've been asking who, what, where, when, why, and how. This week we're talking about why the church. And we take you right away to what I think is the, the scripture passage that absolutely takes it, boils it down, and gives it to us in, in a bullet of what the church, and why it exists, and, and why we should be involved in it. And so here we go. We're in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What a significant passage my wife sang last week upon this rock, and it is absolutely essential to understand the significance and the importance of this passage. First of all, we see that Jesus is having a conversation with all the apostles. And they're giving him just different things about who they, who they think he is. Or basically they're saying this is what other people say. When he says, who do you say I am? Simon is inspired by the Holy Spirit to see exactly who Christ is. Remember, he says, who do they say the Son of Man is? And that's a generic term that can be either a person or it can be the Son of God. Because the Old Testament referred to him as the Son of Man. And so they come back and Peter says, you are the Christ, that is the Messiah. You are the Son of the Most High God. Now this is significant. This is a recognition of who Jesus is, that He is the Messiah. He is the Deliverer of Israel. He is the Son of God. He is God as the Son of God. And so Jesus says, Simon, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. The Holy Spirit has revealed this to you. Now he goes on and he says, Blessed are you. And he goes on and says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's talk about that. Here's the first question that we have today. What was significant about Peter's profession? Here Peter is saying, You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the Most High God. That is extremely significant because for the first time people are recognizing who Jesus is. But it's also significant in what it sets up that comes after. That profession is the same profession you and I make when we come to faith in Christ. That He is our Lord, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. And He is the Son of the Most High God. He is God. And so that profession becomes a foundational profession for the church. And so it's absolutely significant that they recognized who He is and, and we recognize who He is. That leads us to the second question. What is the rock referred to by Jesus, and why do we believe this is so? Now there are lots of different, well at least four different ways people think about this metaphor of the rock. First of all, Peter's name is Petros, and that is, uh, it's Petros, and that is a uh, masculine noun, meaning little stone. And so every time somebody said Peter's name, it was basically saying Little Stone. And so <laughs> we can imagine an English item, John Little Stone. Well, his name was Little Stone. And then Jesus says upon this rock, but he uses the female term Petra, which is a large rock, which is a foundational rock, which is like a large outcropping off of a mountain. Two different words. And a feminine and a masculine never go together. You cannot use a, a, a masculine adverb to describe a, a, a feminine verb or a masculine adjective to describe a feminine noun. And so we see here there are two different things here. Peter is not the rock. Although Peter's confession and, upon, and Peter's importance and all the disciples there together, their importance is that they are going to be the, the, the first stones, the small stones. But Jesus is referred to by Peter, later on by the way, as the chief cornerstone. You see, maybe it's in Peter's mind that he's clearing up some misunderstanding. Peter's not the 
big rock. Peter's a little rock. Jesus is the cornerstone, the big foundation, and the disciples are the next level up. And so we see here then that the confession here, or the, the, what Jesus is saying about himself, is that I'm the rock, your confession is the rock, and then you guys are the little rocks that come on top of it. And so this is really important to understand. We don't have this idea that Peter is the rock of the church and that everything goes by his authority. It is Jesus who's the rock. It is the disciples constantly pointing to the authority of Christ, not to their own authority. And so we see then that this confession, the fact that Jesus is the rock, and then the fact that the, the, the building's being established upon Jesus first and then the apostles and then us. That's extremely important to understand. And so we see that in this passage, and we want to make sure that we're really clear. The rock is the profession, it is Christ, and then in a sense, the ministry of the apostles as they declare Christ. So please make sure you understand that. Now, that brings us to a third question, and that's this. What are the gates of Hades? We often translate this the gates of hell. But Hades is a specific Greek word meaning the land of the dead. Here we see that the idea is that Satan is the, is the lord of the land of the dead. That, that this is a representation of his authority and his power. It's the last thing that he would hold over people is the power of death. And here we see that Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave as the scripture tells us. Therefore, the way death, hell, and the grave are continually conquered is through this profession through Christ obviously and through the ministry of the apostles as that continues through the ages. In other words, through the church. It is the church that defeats the gates of hell. Now this is, this is very important. Understand that gates are stationary. Gates are never offensive weapons. They are always defensive weapons. And the church is not to be waiting and, and defending themselves from the gates of hell, they're to be attacking the gates of hell. That is, rescuing people from hell, rescuing people from the authority of the devil. And so that is an offensive thing that the church is supposed to be doing, is going out and rescuing. You're to be rescuing your family. You're to be rescuing your teammates, your classmates, your workplace. You're to be rescuing your neighbors. We are to be attacking the gates of hell. And obviously, in America today, that is not happening. The church has hunkered down and tried to protect itself instead of going out and attacking. We're not guaranteed that when we just hunker down and do nothing that we're going to be alright, but we are guaranteed in this passage that when we operate as the church and we go on the offensive declaring the good news of Christ, when we are praying against the enemy's strongholds, when we are, when we are helping people by being salt and light and serving in our world, then the gates of hell will not stand against it. That leads us to the fourth question. How are the gates of Hades defeated? Well, I always I already gave away a little bit of that in the last question. But here we see that the gates of Hades again are stationary and the church is to go out. Now here Jesus goes on in this passage and said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now, this is a phrase that would have been familiar to the first century Jews, but it's very unfamiliar to us today. This is important to understand the tense of this verb. Whatever you bind will have already been bound in heaven. In other words, when you go out and you attack the gates of hell, when you use the authority that God's given you, when you walk in that power, when you pray, when you teach, when you share the gospel, when you raise your kids up in the way they should go, we see that that's already doing, that's doing what God's established already. In other words, you're walking in the victory that's already been done. This is important. We don't declare and decide what happens in heaven. When we do the right thing, we are following along with, our, with what's already happened in heaven. So when we attack the gates of hell, we're just fulfilling what's already been established. Satan's been defeated, and we get to live in that victory right here and now. So here's the point. We walk in the authority, we do what we're called to do, we share the gospel, we pray, we, we teach the truth, we, we're salt and light in the world by helping and serving our world, and we know this, nothing can stand against that.
because it's already been established in heaven. And when we do that, we are doing what has already been bound and what's already been loosed in heaven. So it's important to understand that verb tense in the Greek. It's already been done in heaven, and when we do it here on earth, we're doing what's already been bound and loosed there. And so I hope this has helped you today, and more than anything, I hope that you will be the church. Listen, I said this this morning whenever I preached in this passage, but this is very important to understand. If you don't do it for your children, nobody is. If you don't do it for your neighborhood, if you don't do it for your city, if you don't do it for your nation, if you don't do it for the world, the gates of hell will have found victory in your circumstance. And so you want to be on the side that wins. In the end, we see that the gates of hell will not prevail, but you have to determine your place in that plan. Are you going to do your part? Are you going to be the church? Are you going to see that victory in your family, in your life, in your community? I pray hope. I pray and hope so. God bless you. Thanks for joining us today.